This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns and tell your story on the child welfare system. Today we're going to have Maria interview Bill Tyler from Big Rapids, Michigan, and he's going to tell his story. Let's go to that interview. Um, today we have Bill and Bill Taylor and we just want to thank you for being on our show today. Um, I understand that you've had some issues with CPS and what what brought that about? How did that start? Well CPS first came into my life and it was between the schools and the hospitals calling um, and every time they come over they'd find nothing wrong. I had a uh, CPS agent say that if we kept coming back and finding nothing wrong, we'd just drop the case. But I kept getting referral after referral. And then I kept, they kept coming over and finding nothing wrong. They substantiated a couple cases, which, um, a couple of their referrals, which um, brought me to court. Uh, when I got to the court um, and read the petition, um, I had found some inaccuracies on the petition itself as far as allegations that CPS had already said that had no evidence of abuse or neglect but was stated on the petition anyway as a liable reason to take my children. Um, and then I got, uh, when they took my kids, I also noticed some inaccuracies on the order to take my children. Um, and in this case, uh, anything that's falsified on a written document is actually a criminal offense um, as far as perjury and also it violates the constitutional rights of the 4th and 14th Amendment um, which states that any warrant basically found under false pretenses is invalid um, and that the uh, TPS agents themselves can be held accountable for that action. So you notice some inconsistencies in the paperwork from CPS when you received the allegations. There was some stuff that was incorrect. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And yes, they. Um, there's one allegation that me and Courtney got into a disagreement where there were police involved. And when the police came out, all the children were sleeping. They were sleeping the whole time CP the, the police officers were there. Um, and when they left, they were still sleeping. So there was no abuse or neglect in that situation because none of the children heard any of the disagreement that me and, me and Courtney had that night. Um, and furthermore, the police report on the allegations says that it'd be noted that the children were sleeping the whole time we were in the home. Um, another one is about my son's weight in Trevor City. Um, he was born with a rare chromosome abnormality where chromosome 13 and 11 switched places mm -hmm. and part of 13 was deleted which caused bilateral retinoblastoma of the eyes, which is basically cancer of both eyes. Um, and his mental disabilities is pretty much everything that mimics autism without actually being autistic. autistic. Okay. Um, <laughs> they kept 
on about our weight. They sent us to the doctors. The doctor had told us that um, he was in his normal BMI for his range for age and height. Um, then we got more referrals for the same thing. Um, so much that the doctor that we were seeing, the pediatrician, said that it sounds like CPS is singling you two out. Um, so in the end, that was also written on the petition to take my, my, my the petition to, to get in-home jurisdiction for my children, um, which on the referral that they'd stated had no proof of abuse or neglect again right. for a second time. Now, <clears throat> was your son's doctor concerned about his weight or about um, issues with that? Not at all. So your doctor, as your son's pediatrician, was not worried about it, no. but CPS was? Well, the school was. Uh, CPS had to finally come in after the, like, the third referral and tell CPS, or the second or third, and tell CPS to stop weighing my children, sorry, stop telling the school that they need to stop weighing the children. Okay, so at that point, I would say then even CPS realized that um, your son was being cared for properly and didn't need to be weighed all the time. Right. Okay. Um, what other diagnosis do your children have? My oldest son was born with um, ADHD and ODD. Um, which is attention hyper, attention deficit hyper disorder, and ODD is oppositional defiance disorder. Um, my middle son, I just explained to you, he was born with a rare chromosome abnormality that caused cancer. Um, my third child was born with ADHD and head seizures. Um, so those are the special needs of my children. Okay. So they're all special needs kids? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> um, what made you realize that it's possible that maybe CPS is not trying to help in the care of your children and looking out for your children? All three times in, in this case, there's been issues all three times that my children's been removed. The first issue I've kind of explained already where it, it was... Uh, perjury on the petition and perjury on the order to take the children, a uh, violation of constitutional rights. So basically violation of state and constitutional law. Mm -hmm. And the second one, it was violation of state and constitutional law. Again, I was told that I, what it said on the petition was that Mr. Taylor, if Mr. Taylor complies with services, a petition may not be needed. Well, you have a constitutional right to be able to raise your children without the interference of state or local government. You have the right Absolutely. to tell these people no. Yep. You do. You have the right to tell these people no. But they countered that by giving me a petition to the courtroom that I had to be in court because I was refusing to comply with services. And then the judge, after everything was said and done, the judge asked me the same question. Mr. Taylor, will you comply with services? I told him the same thing. I have the right to say no here because I have the right to raise my children without the interference of state or local government. Mm -hmm. His response was to remove my children when CPS was only asking for in-home jurisdiction. Even though I had the right to say no to the services that even brought me to the courtroom in the first place. So I'm pretty sure that that made you feel like you don't have a say in your raise, raising your own children and there's I do know that there's a lot of other um, parents around the country that feel the same way and that have dealt with the same thing um, when it comes to dealing with your children not all parents agree with each other what's best for their kids so what services did you participate in with the attempt to reunificate during the process, I, uh, I did services that included like the wraparound program, Families First, the Laundry Project, help with car repair, um, wraparound, um, carpet cleaning services. Um, we decided to get a dog and <laughs> it probably wasn't the best time to get a dog. Uh, we didn't really have time to potty train it so it would mm -hmm. potty in, in, in the kids' bedroom. 
and the kids would cover it up and we wouldn't even know it was there. So we ended up having to get carpet cleaning services over there through CPS to get the carpets cleaned so the kids could sleep back in their room because right. they were sleeping on a couch at that point because I wouldn't let them sleep in their bedroom. Um, so that was how that worked out. Um, I also did parenting classes, two sets of parenting classes. And, and how, did the, how did the parenting classes go? Uh, I completed both parenting classes. Um, the one in Traverse City was called uh, Love and Logic, and the second one I think was called AOI, out of Big Rapids. Um, I did both parenting classes, completed them both. Did an excellent job. Uh, I've had counseling services through uh, grief counseling um, for Courtney passing away, and I've also had um, regular counseling through uh, Dr. Barnes and doc uh, Dr. Bolesk. Okay, well let me just back up there a minute because there's part of the, um, part of the stuff that has been going on with this case is that your um, girlfriend, Yes. When all this started to take place, you were together. Yes. And <clears throat> there was some differences of opinions on how it should be handled, I understand. Can you tell us a little bit about that? As far as? Um, as far as you felt you should fight it and she felt she should take a plea deal on it. Well, what had happened at this point is the... Uh, Assistant prosecuting attorney in the case, um, her and I got together with my lawyer at the time, and um, I explained to her what all the inaccuracies of that were on the petition, plus the order to take the children. Um, about a couple months later, the APA decided to step down from the case because her relationship with CPS had deteriorated. Um, the way the guardian and litem put it was that she believed that a case could not be made. So um, she stepped down. Um, by law, DHS now has the opportunity to hire a, another prosecuting attorney to take over this case within 10 days. And that's what they did. Um, when they came back, when we adjourned and we came back, they had, it was, uh, I had a lawyer and my girlfriend had a lawyer. So they could put us both in separate rooms and kind of go after each one of us alone without us standing together as right. parents. So they, um, they, they told Courtney that they were going to terminate our parental rights if we lost the case. I wanted to fight the whole time because I didn't think there was enough evidence there at all to, and plus, you know, with the state and constitutional law breaking, I didn't think there was any chance that we would lose. Right. But when they told, <coughs> my girlfriend that it was termination if we lost and the chance of her losing her kids permanently she decided to take a plea and the plea was not being able to take care of the children for medical reasons because at the time she had a heart condition uh, cardiomyopathy and uh, she knew she probably didn't have much time with the children left mm -hmm. so she didn't want to take that chance so she took the plea on the deal as I did not um, was she, at that point, was she terminal? No, at that point they were still trying to introduce pacemaker and then I think they introduced an LBAD and about the time the LBAD kicked in is when it was getting pretty terminal. Okay. <clears throat> so she was aware that she may not have a lot of time left with the kids. Right. And didn't want to risk that time or what little time she had with fighting right um to continue custody even though you know she may lose her life right so that would be a tough decision for anybody i mean dealing with a with an illness that could take your life is hard but imagining doing it without your children i i can't even imagine it's tough it's one of the toughest things i've ever been through yeah i had I to bet. take care of three special needs children and a, a sick girlfriend for three years by myself. Wow. You know, that's pretty tough to deal with. Now, did CPS ever offer any support as far as 
for your girlfriend or did they offer any type of thing that would help her be able to care for her children for the remainder of the time she had left? I mean, did you feel that, like they were stepping in to try to help her be with her kids until she either got better or died? They did let her see the kids uh, once in a while. Um, and she was in the hospital most of the time. Um, I don't think she got to see too much of them, the later stages that she got to, to be because she didn't really want the kids to see her that way. They didn't want, she didn't want them to remember her like she was at the end. Um, the last thing I told her was that I promise I'm going to get these kids back any way I can. And I still haven't fulfilled that promise yet, but I'm, I'm working but on it. Fighting. I am working on it. You're yeah. still fighting. That says a lot. <laughs> um, so you guys knew that it could go either way when she was sick. Um, I have to imagine that that had to be a lot of stress on you guys, on both of you, as far as taking care of special needs kids and a girlfriend that's, that's very sick. <clears throat> Do you think that the jumping through hoops with CPS and all that stuff contributed to the, the death of your um, girlfriend? I cannot 100% say that, but with the stress and everything else, the first time that the kids got removed from our care, uh, Courtney immediately fell down and had what they call a pseudo seizure. Right when the judge came down and said, we're removing your kids, I mean, she just Flat out had a seizure right there in the courtroom. Wow. So do I think that it contributed to all the stress and pain that's caused the trauma that went through the kids went through and everything else contributed to her death? I can't say it 100 percent, but yeah, I, I personally believe so. That's really sad. You know, <clears throat> I would like to think that you know CPS is there to, especially in a situation like this where you've got one parent dying. Um, ideally, I would like to see CPS step in and give that parent support so the children have that time left with that parent. And if they believe there is an issue, come in and help with that issue, you know, as long as you can. That's what's best for the mom, and that's most definitely what's best for the children in that situation. That's one of the things here at Silent Voices that we want to see happen is that CPS actually tries to reunify, reunify um, good parents with their kids, not step in where they're not, um, where they shouldn't be. So you guys also went to counseling and did psyche bells. Yes. we. Our first counseling venture was with a um, marriage counselor um, for that um, disagreement we had where the cops were involved. Um, CPS wanted us to go to marriage counseling, so we did. We went through 12 sessions, completed it. Um, we also had our, our own psych evaluations through a specialist that DHS uses across the, straight, uh, the state. Okay. Um, and then uh, after Courtney died, I had grief counseling with another um, counselor. Um, and we've done two different psyche valves for the doctor that goes around the state and does his work with DHS. Okay, so he works with DHS, so they're supposed to, um, I, I would imagine they put a lot of credibility into his evaluations. Yes. <clears throat> okay, and how did that how did that go for you? Well, honestly, the doctor stated between the first and second interview, he's like, "You've changed." He's like, "Your responses are different. Your you know your first responses were about death and dying and cancer and all you know how just horrible life was becoming at that point and." You know, after your kids got taken and your girlfriend died, it, it changed to more of like, you know, all about Courtney and all about the kids and all about everything that, that they've been through. And, you know, it just, he said it's, 
I see no problem with you getting your kids back. It just seems kind of um, strange that if their own psychologist is saying that you seem to be in a really healthy place and seem to be doing good with the children, why CPS would not take his word when that's, that's what these cases usually are, they work around the evaluations. So, you know, these evaluators sometimes will say this parent is really not up to taking care of these children. But for you to go through everything that you and the kids have been through, and for him to say, I think this is a good father, and for them still not to, you know, take his words into consideration and place your children back with you is beyond me. That just doesn't make any sense. Well, that was the first hurdle I had to go through. There were several other hurdles I had to go through. I did eventually get my kids back. Um, and they were jumping to hurdle after hurdle after hurdle, you know, parenting classes, counseling, you know, this, that, and the other. I had a paid babysitter come over and watch me with my children every day for a couple hours, once a week, every day. You know, at first it was every day, and then it switched to, you know, every every other day or every week. And um, she had thought that um, CPS was setting me up for failure, for being a single dad and not giving me any services I could possibly. They don't have any services. I can have three special needs kids. Right. You know, one of my children has a diagnosis that's only been diagnosed two other times in the world. You know, there's no book or no, I can't go to Meyer and get a book on parenting and how to raise a child with special needs, especially the ones that they have. Um, it's a difficult road. You, 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 it's trial and error. You learn as you go. You make mistakes. That's part of being a parent. Absolutely. You know, part of being a human being. Yeah. You know, we all make mistakes. Um, none of us are perfect. Yeah, and I agree with that fully. That's, that makes it tough, especially something that's really rare. Um, I think that, you know, I guess what I would look to is the specialists and what they're saying and your doctor also just for the, he may not know about that special need exactly, but he does know your kids. Yeah, they were they were talking about doing certain things. Like some of these services they brought in were to try to help my child do this or do that, and they found out that the service didn't help them at all. Yeah. So it's like the more and more services I do, the more and more I realize that none of the services that the state have to offer help. That's why I didn't want to do no more services the second time. Right. I was done with it. I was over it. It's just, it, it's a shame that they play doctor and sometimes even judges do and diagnose children with different things that aren't, um, if they get actually down to a clinical diagnosis with a real doctor, they'll a lot of times find out that these um, diagnoses that the courts are handing out or social workers are handing out are false. You know, you have to go to school a long time to diagnose issues. I mean, you need your MD, PhD, something to be able to, to do that. Um, so this is a really big problem. And, you know, this happens in so many cases. It's not just your case. I've heard of this happening so much. And it's just, it's wrong. It's flat out wrong. Um, that's why we have doctors. They're the ones that are to be taking care of these children. You did eventually get your children back. What, um, what happened after that and how did that go? It was going rather well. Um, the school had called um, a couple times on a referral. Like one time they called about his socks being dirty. Um, you know, and I looked at the CPS agent that came over and I said, it still smells like laundry detergent. They're just old socks. Mm -hmm. You know, it yeah. didn't have no reason to call CPS whatsoever. Um, you know, but the, the, the camel that broke the straws back, I guess you would say, was basically I went to the gas station to pick up some milk because I ran out of milk for the kids. It was about 10 o'clock at night. I just got my middle son out of the shower. So I told my oldest one that was 11, just keep an eye, 10 minutes back and forth to the gas station. <clears throat> I went to the gas station, came back, and my oldest son had got mad at my youngest son, threw the iPad, hit him in the head, caused a big gash in his head. Um, 
as I was taking my son into the, there for a shower to clean up the gas to see if I had to go to the hospital, my oldest son had run away because he was worried that he was going to get in trouble. So I had to call the police. And eventually we found him and they had me take the youngest one to the hospital to get stitches. And um, CPS had told me that they weren't going to take my children that night. And all of a sudden on that Monday, they were telling me I was either going to lose or take my, terminate my parental rights or I had to sign guardianship over. Because the incident happened on a Friday. And CPS that night, the on-call CPS agent told me that they weren't, they weren't going to take my kids. It was an accident. Right. And the lawyers, I guess, got together and decided to remove my children from my care. You know, all, all I want to say about that last, last part is that once a child is 12 years old, they're able to take care of even babies. Um, they're allowed to babysit legally. So, you know, I don't know when you've got children that age and you're running up to the store, like you said, I well, wouldn't According think. to the Michigan Child Protection Law, it's there is no legal age that a child can be left at home. The rule of thumb is ten or below is not responsible enough. Right. Eleven and twelve, they have to be evaluated, but it's a case by case basis. Sometimes CPS has even called on an eleven year old watching kids. Right. Well, I know that at twelve years old they can be certified to watch kids. So. Right. I guess maybe we need to look at. Um, look at these laws and see how we can, you know, get them to be more upfront about what they're expecting. You know, imagine every parent has to use their judgment and whether your child is responsible enough. I just want to thank you for coming on the show and telling your story and hopefully this will, you know, get the information out there so people see what is going on. Um, I'm sorry what you've been through, that's awful. You know, to have special needs kids and have their mom um, die like that, that's gotta be horrible. But we wish you the best in the future and hopefully you'll get your kids back and everything will go well. Thank you. And I wanna thank you, the viewer, for tuning in this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your voice can make, can make the, the difference. difference.